Hello, this is Professor Roman. I want to continue our lectures on linear algebra. We have just discussed Schur's theorem under the condition that the matrix or operator in question has minimal polynomial that splits over the base field. And we'll continue that assumption in this lecture. <clears throat> What we saw was that any square matrix whose minimal polynomial splits is unitarily similar to an upper triangular matrix. Put in operator language, any finite dimensional linear operator whose minimal polynomial splits can be represented by an upper triangular matrix. This, as I have mentioned, is one of the most important, if not the most important, result in matrix theory. However, it's not, doesn't quite have that status when it comes to the issue of canonical forms, because distinct upper triangular matrices can be unitarily similar. And what I mean by distinct is it's not just a matter of reordering of some entries or something. It can be uh, profoundly different. So upper triangular matrices do not provide a set of canonical forms for unitary similarity. Also, upper triangular matrices are not as easy to deal with as we would like. We have discussed the fact that uh, diagonal matrices are much nicer, and we would like to, it would have been nice if every linear operator could be represented by a diagonal matrix, but that is not the case. We did discuss this issue of diagonalizability, not unitary diagonalizability, but just ordinary diagonalizability in the previous chapter. In fact, in quite some, uh, uh, even farther back than that, but in the previous chapter, where we understood the concept of minimal polynomial, we saw that there were several conditions that would guarantee diagonalizability, one of which was that the minimal polynomial splits into distinct linear factors. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not a very easy property to check. We may not even be able to find the minimal polynomial, let alone see if it factors into linear factors. So <clears throat> that is uh, those that condition for diagonalizability is somewhat unsatisfactory or unsatisfying. But now we are dealing with unitary diagonalizability. That is to say, we'd like to know when a linear operator can be represented by a diagonal matrix under an orthonormal basis, because orthonormal bases are advantageous. In matrix language, we just want to know when a square matrix is unitarily similar to a diagonal matrix. A surprising thing is going to happen the condition for ordinary diagonalizability, one of which is that the minimal polynomial splits into a product of distinct linear factors, is, as I just said, uh, not a pleasant property, not a pleasant uh, way to determine diagonalizability. It's going to turn out that, unit, that determining unitary diagonalizability is very simple. There's a very simple algebraic requirement that anybody who knows matrix multiplication can check. 
Um, so th this result, which is known as the spectral theorem, is quite remarkable. <clears throat> to put the matter bluntly, <clears throat> if we have a matrix A, square matrix, whose minimal polynomial splits, we can produce a sure form for it. It's upper triangular. We do this by successive linear deflations, as we've discussed. That in itself is not a simple matter to do, but let's say we have done it. The spectral theorem tells us when this when the sure when any sure form in fact for a is diagonal if one sure form is diagonal they all will be as we'll see these matrices a are called unitarily diagonalizable because they are similar to a diagonal matrix under an orthogonal, a, a unitary similarity. Okay. Now, there are different approaches to arriving at the spectral theorem. That is to say, arriving at the condition required on a matrix A for it to be unitarily diagonalizable, similar, unitarily similar to a diagonal matrix. I think, well, in my experience anyway, the most common approach is to define a property. And as I said before, it's a very simple algebraic property called normality. Descri describe its properties and show that in fact it is, necess it is necessar a necessary and sufficient property to guarantee unitary diagonalizability. Nothing wrong with that approach. It's the one I took in my advanced linear algebra book. But for this book and even if I were to rewrite the Advanced Linear Algebra book, I might change this also. I thought it would be better for us to go through an analysis that maybe the first person to do this went through, and that is to say, this is what I want, how do I get it? And arrive at the normality condition that way rather than start with the definition of normality, which in a sense at that point would be unmotivated. To put the matter very directly, we start with the matrix A, we produce a sure form for it, it's upper triangular. What we want to know is what would it take to guarantee that M is diagonal that all of the entries above the main diagonal are zero. Simple question, not necessarily a simple resolution. Okay. Well, <coughs> if we write the matrix M, we denote its elements by Bij, then the first upper left entry is lambda 1, so we can write M this way. I've written out the first row the first column after B11 is are all zeros because remember this is upper triangular, and M1 is the remaining submatrix and it is also upper triangular. If I take its adjoint, it looks like this: the first row becomes the first column, but conjugates. First column becomes first row again, com complex conjugates. M1 turns into M1 star. Now we look at this for just a couple minutes and notice something. We take the product M times M star. 
the first row, the first entry in the product comes from the first row times the first column. We are taking each element, multiplying it by its complex conjugate, which gives us the norm squared of that element. We add them up. But if we take the product in the reverse order, then the first entry is the first row here times the first column here. All the zeros match up. We just get B11 times B11 complement. In other words, the norm of B11 squared. Well, I don't think it stretches the imagination too much to say what happens if these two products are equal? If these are equal, then these, this sum is equal to this, and so all these other terms must be zero, because we're dealing with non-negative numbers here. And so all the other b's are zero. b12 through b1n is zero, and this is now what m looks like. we have progressed in our search for an answer to this question because now we've got remember we're trying to uh, arrange it so that all the uh, elements above the main diagonal are zero we've done so for the first row we like this so we continue with it Assuming that the that m m star equals m star m, or in other words, that m commutes with its adjoint, <clears throat> we can then look at this these products again. Now that we know what m and m star look like, and we'll get this. Well. <clears throat> this shows that M1 commutes with its adjoint as well. This is a property of block matrix multiplication. So we can apply the same analysis we just did to the submatrix M1 and conclude that its first row and column are behave the way we want them to behave, and we'll end up with these two matrices. M will now look like this. It'll have a 2 by 2 diagonal in the upper left corner, two rows of zeros, two columns of zeros, and a smaller submatrix here, M2. Well, the same thing will apply to M2. We can repeat this or do an inductive argument and show that M is diagonal. So, under the assumption that M is, first of all, it's a sure form, it's upper triangular, that M commutes with its adjoint, M must be diagonal. So commuting with the adjoint is obviously the key here, so that calls for a definition. A matrix A is normal if it commutes with its adjoint. A linear operator on an inner product space is normal if it commutes with its adjoint. <clears throat> now, before continuing, we should pause here because whenever we define a property on matrices, it's wise to check and see if that property is a similarity invariant, and in particular in our situation, a unitary similarity invariant. And the answer is yes. If a unitary similarity class contains 
a normal matrix, then it contains only normal matrices. That's another way of saying that if a matrix is normal, then any other matrix that's unitarily similar to that matrix will also be normal. So the whole similar, unitary similarity class contains normal. They're all, all normal. If one is normal, they're all normal. That means we can apply the term normal to sim unitary similarity classes. We'll say that a unitary similarity class is normal if and only if it's, uh, it contains one and therefore all normal matrices. Also, if a linear operator tau, here's a linear operator tau, here are the matrices that represent it under orthonormal order bases. Tau is normal if and only if the unitary similarity class that represents it is normal. The, the proof is pretty straightforward for part one, if A and B are unitarily similar, they have this relationship, we can compute B, B star and B star B. So B, B star is this, B star B is this. These are equal if and only if A is normal. So these are equal. In other words, B is normal if and only if A is normal. For the second part, <clears throat> by the algebraic properties of the adjoint, we can take tau star tau represented uh, matrix representation with respect to B. <clears throat> tau star tau is self-adjoint, so we can put an asterisk here. I'll let you sort out why that is. There's one more statement to be made here. And that's equal to this. We split tau star tau b into tau star b tau b. <clears throat> that's the same as this, which gives us that. And we do the same thing with tau tau star reversed. We'll get this. So tau is normal if and only if its matrix representation is normal. In case there's a little confusion, I, I should mention uh, another way we could have done this. We could have defined normality for matrices that commute with their own adjoint, shown that it's a unitary, uh, it's invariant under unitary similarity, and then said um, that the unitary similarity class is normal if and only if it contains one and therefore all the matrices are normal. And then we could have said, well, since we've done that, we can say that an operator is normal if it is represented by normal matrices under orthonormal order bases. That's the pattern we've used in the past. For example, that's how we defined a characteristic polynomial of an operator. There was no natural way to do that without connecting it with its matrix representations. Here, then we would have to show that tau is normal under that definition if and only if tau commutes with its own adjoint. <clears throat> That would fit the patterns we've used before more closely. But since there's already a natural way to define normality of operators, namely they commute with their adjoints, and that's probably the standard definition, that's the road I, the, the road I chose. And then we make the connection. Tau is normal if and only if its matrix representations are normal. All right, so we've done a bit of analysis. What we have shown is that it, an upper triangular matrix that is normal 
has to be diagonal. The converse is pretty obvious. Diagonal matrix is normal. I'll let you fill in the one or two lines for that. <clears throat> and we've then um, shown that normality is a unitary similarity, is invariant under unitary similarity. So now let's summarize what we've done. <clears throat> and uh, I drew these pictures. I don't know if it will help very much, but we deal this is a unitary similarity class whose minimal polynomial splits, that is to say, the minimal polynomial, you know, it's the same for all entries in all matrices in the class, so that minimal polynomial splits. Shor's theorem told us that there are some upper triangular matrices in such a unitary similarity class, at least one, generally a lot more than one. <clears throat> Shor's theorem tells us that all, if the unitary similarity class is normal, all of those upper triangular matrices are in fact diagonal. So, <clears throat> the theorem, an upper triangular matrix is diagonal if and only if it's normal. That was the direct consequence, the direct conclusion from the analysis we did at the beginning of the lecture. Thus, a unitary similarity class whose minimal polynomial splits is normal if and only if all of its upper triangular matrices are diagonal. This is probably where I should say, <coughs> see the figure. I forgot to specifically say that. <clears throat> a finite dimensional linear operator, tau, whose minimal polynomial splits, is unitarily diagonalizable, in other words, representable by a diagonal matrix under an orthonormal basis if and only if tau is normal because tau is normal if and only if its matrix representations are normal. <clears throat> that is essentially the spectral theorem, it, the part two here, but I prefer to embellish it uh, to give a, a more complete statement of the theorem. Shor's, uh, I'm sorry, the spectral theorem, minimal polynomial splits. <clears throat> so for a matrix A, whose minimal polynomial splits, the following are equivalent. A is normal. A is unitarily diagonalizable. That is, it has a diagonal Shor form. Remember, by sure form, we mean any similar matrix under a change of orthonormal basis, a unitarily similar matrix. And the diagonal elements are, of course, the eigenvalues for this matrix and for A because of the similarity. The pair FNA has an orthonormal eigenbasis. That's the basis that gives us this diagonal matrix. It's orthonormal because the change of basis to go from A to this diagonal matrix is a change from the standard basis to another orthonormal basis because this is unitary similarity. <clears throat> Fn is the orthogonal direct sum of eigenspaces. And this is the operator version, which I will let you read for yourself. And it would be great practice if you could uh, 
fill in this proof without reading it first. See if you're connected with all of this. Okay. Um, so the upshot is, as I said earlier, we did have a result concerning diagonalizability of an operator that and not just ordinary diagonalizability not unitary diagonalizability one of the conditions that guarantees that is that the minimal polynomial splits into distinct linear factors not a pleasant thing to check sure uh, the spectral theorem tells us we can very easily determine whether an operator is unitarily diagonalizable or equivalently whether a matrix has, is unitarily similar to a diagonal matrix all we have to do is take the matrix compute its adjoint take the two products see if they're the same so the spectral theorem is quite remarkable in the next lecture, we will look at what happens when the minimal polynomial does not split.